when he says God has done this same thing in us, giving us this deposit. What he's saying is, I hate to do this to you, but in the previous chapter, he was talking about buffetings and the things that we will encounter through life. And then goes into this, for we know that if our earthly, essentially, it's not, it does not read like this, but I'm going to say it like this. Take courage, be strong, no matter what's going on, whatever buffetings you're going to take, know this, this will be dissolved and the actuality of what was promised will be fulfilled. But in the meantime, God has given, given that deposit of his nature to tether you, to make you see, to make you understand an eternal destiny that links you to him in a special way, that it is God that has done this thing, that it is God that will clothe you with a new body, and it is God in his binding contract with you will make good on the thing that he has started. The Bible says he started something in you and he is faithful to bring it to fruition. God has a way, and I'm going to use this word because it's the best one I can think of. Once we come to the faith, our eyes are open. He gives us something of him that I've used the word tethered, like a tether ball that's attached, a ball that's attached to a post that you can swing around, you can punch it, you can do whatever you want, but it'll still be attached to the post that is firmly rooted into the ground. We are tethered to him in eternity by something he has done to us when we come to the faith. So I want to talk about three passages of scripture, but specifically I'm going to focus on one or two and use the two or the three to emphasize, to make emphasis of repetition. So I'm going to ask for you to turn to 2 Corinthians, and if you have a Bible like mine, which many of you have, it's 2 Corinthians, uh, we're in the first chapter, verse 21 and 22, page 1443, if you have a Bible like mine. All right. So I want you to take a look at something. Um, this opening chapter is in many ways uh, kind of a driving point. Remember, if, if, if there were four letters, which I believe there were three or four letters to the Corinthians, we only have one and two. But you can kind of see that the opening of 2 Corinthians in the first chapter is is almost a way of reinforcing Paul's ministry. And it's pretty tragic if you, if we, if we really think about it, because I, I suffer this same thing in this day and age, and I realize I don't take it personally because it's the same spirit at work. But can you imagine somebody is coming to save you from drowning and has given you all the tools, has given you the life-saving device, and has told you what to do, and instead of taking hold of the device and taking hold of the method and taking hold of all of that to save yourself, you spend more time tearing down the person who brought the device to you, who brought you the help, and questioning their motives and questioning, well, you know, if, if they're this, then why that? I have to deal with this with my ministry as well, in my calling. And my attitude towards that is, hey, listen, if you're... If you're not savvy enough to understand, I have one motive, and that's to help people make it in, and not just barely, but make it in with full faith, understanding that there is something well beyond the grave that we have to look to. Failure to look at that will be a great surprise for many. If I'm going to take a trip, I want to know the destination. I want to know how long it's going to take me to get there. I can't answer that in the lifetime. I don't know. My days are numbered by God. I don't have access to that. But I want to know where my destination is, where I'm going, what it takes to get there. I may not, and no, I will not make it in and say, well, I've, I've checked all the boxes. And anybody who thinks they can do that either is kind of silly. But you be informed, and then you stand on the things you've learned by faith. And that's what we're doing here. So I want you to take a look at, after Paul is kind of revisiting the essence of his ministry. Just in the opening chapters, when he says to you, you know, 
He says, we write none other things unto you than what we read or acknowledge that, and I trust that ye shall acknowledge even to the end. And he's basically saying, I'm only coming to preach to you. This is my motive. Essentially, his motive was always coming into question. But it's interesting because in verse 21 and 22, he says, Now he which establish us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God, who hath also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Now, why is this important to my opening comments about understanding and the tethering? Because, see, there are a lot of people who don't understand or maybe they don't believe or they don't know, that once we come to the faith, this is exactly what happened on the day of Pentecost, but in a more concentrated, infinitely greater way with the, with the giving or the coming of the Spirit, that gave the people there gathered in the upper room not only power to go out and fulfill the Great Commission, which was to preach and to teach and to make learners, but they had recollection of things that were said or written, either passed on by oral tradition, passed on by the mouth of the Lord, or circulated and discussed by the disciples, but they had the capacity thereafter to go out into the world and being alone without much equipping books, like today I can be surrounded by books, but these didn't have that. It was the Holy Spirit. Remember, I keep saying this. The Holy Spirit was given for what? Equipment for service, not for spiritual display and spiritual games. And as some people say, it's the mark of salvation. Because people will use that to say, well, if you speak in tongues and if you can do these things. Now, you know, I've said this before, but I just want to say it to put the finger in the face of those who do this nonsense because you turn other people off with your stupidity. But let me ask you this. So by that logic, People who speak in tongues are saved, and people who don't are not. So what do we do with people who were born with a speech impediment, who can never speak? What do we do with people who are born or have accidents where they lose their tongue or their ability to speak? Are they therefore not saved? See, this is the stuff that I don't like that goes on within, unfortunately, within Christian preaching. It's nonsensical to think that somehow one must have the ability to speak, and therefore that's the mark. Again, I digress to this very fact because we've got people who may have all kinds of disfigurations and disformations or inabilities or things that are challenges that make it so they are not like people who have perhaps full faculties or full functioning of their, uh, their entire being. So do you say that these people are not saved? That's ridiculous. That's why I'm saying to you, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in Jesus' name that I just wish people would just, you know, get, get the real facts, and then it would take away a lot of the silliness. All right, so in, first, uh, in 2 Corinthians 1, verses 21 and 21, 21 and 22, and he says, Now he which established us with you. Let me get my Greek New Testament, so 122, which says, and yes, I have both of these here. So the, the word which is in verse 21, uh, which, which the Greek word for establisheth, is bebeon. And this word, kind of interesting, the word itself is, it's more than just establishing. And I probably maybe in maybe the next message or two or on a festival, one of the programs that I tape, we'll do a word study and we'll look at some of these words more carefully. But this bebeon, um, which kind of sets the tone, is more when we read the word establish. In fact, let me tell you from the Strong's so we can kind of have a point of departure. So Strong's 950 is our, our word. And from the Strong's 950, uh, it is from bebeo, or bebeo, uh, to stabilitate, to confirm, from bebeost, sure, fixed, to make firm, or steadfast, to confirm, spoken of persons, spoken of things, to corroborate, to ratify, to establish by arguments or proofs, 
So we can, we can use the word establish, but it's an old English word. We might, we might say it might be more of, and I don't want to even use the word confirmation because that leans towards some other ideas which I want to stay away from. But essentially it is something that God is saying, you, I have chosen you. That choosing uh, action in the realm of the equation, which is not a movable factor. Now, I have, on my side, I have the right to say, I don't want this or I'm not interested. But that word carries or conveys with it a sense of rooting out and permanizing, in a sense, from God's perspective to us, okay? Not the other way around. Um, and then there's a play on words here, which is missed sloppily by the English, when it says, established us with you in Christ, and hath anointed us is God. This is kind of sloppy. There's a play on words in the Greek, which is, and I'll read it in Greek, O de bebeon umas sun umen ais Christon kai krisas. These words, it's a play on words, Christon, Christ, kai, and krisas, having anointed Christ and having anointed us. So it's almost like, and I'm going to say it this way because it'll make the most sense when we go back to the English now, he which has rooted us, if you will, has made something from coming from him. That's a selection of, we'll say, definitive, uh, I want you, that kind of permanency or that kind of direct approach that has done that. Us with you in Christ and hath, bear with me, hath Christed us. It says anointed, but the word Christus Christon and Christus is a play in words. As he is the anointed one, we too are anointed with him. And why that's important is in the Old Testament, even in the Old Testament, when people were anointed and they were anointed with oil, if you think about all the passages which that is referred to, it was in a sense a confirmation of the selection and usually an establishing for an order, a work, or a mission. So it's kind of interesting that even here we can see plainly that in God's choosing, we are being put on a similar plane, not same exact, but a similar plane with Christ, who hath also sealed us and given us of the Spirit in our hearts. And this is what I want to talk about. These words, uh, sealed and earnest. Two important words that not only appear here, but let me show you where else they appear in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 5. You'll find the same concept. If you read through, and I'll come back to reading through 2 Corinthians 1 through 5, but it says, Now he that hath wrought us for the self same thing is God, who also hath given us the earnest of the Spirit. And um, if we take Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, which says essentially the, the exact same thing. We're talking about sealed and earnest, these two words. And why do I want to focus on those? Because they speak of what I was talking about, the tethering activity into eternity, but they also speak of the transformative element that is made possible for the believer in the believer by God, not by the believer. Now, for some people, this is, maybe you're hearing for this for the first time and you're going, wow, that's wacky and radical. Well, I'm not making this up. I'm simply telling you what's in this book, which is why I say to you, change will come. But what happens when change doesn't come? Which is why I'm, I'm actually tackling this subject because the important part of this equation is, what about people who have come to the faith they're still gripped by fear because of death. They're still gripped by the concept that there may be this uncertain unknown of after I die, what happens? Because in their mind, I cannot know, I can't possibly know, and it's so uncertain that it becomes the paralysis that people basically stay parked in because they can never get beyond this element that I'm discussing 
and I'll explain why these two words are important. In the Greek word, I just want to show you, because I've written down the scriptures here, to show you that these words, and the this, this same word has an E in front of it, but it's the same word that appeared up here, but you can see it's repeated three times. So let's talk about this first word, that is the word being used for seal, sealing, sealed, etc. You get, you get the idea. Let's talk about this. So the first thing I want to tell you is I am regretting that I did not bring with something, a little show and tell. I love, as you know, history and antiquity, and I collect. Um, I collect seals. I think I brought a, um, a small seal I showed to you at one point, which is, looked like, looks like a little uh, oblong bead. And basically, they did these, these type of seals were done uh, where you would roll it out in, in clay, and it would either give an imprint, it would have a message. If we look at a lot of these inscriptions, they were done with something like a seal. But I also collect seals from uh, English history, because that's pretty much, I would say, an area of, that I know a lot about, that I've spent a lot of time studying. And uh, so I started collecting those specifically from Henry VIII and Elizabeth, a lot of those seals that were essentially attached at one point to documents. Some of them are, that I have are still attached to land documents. Some of them were put on letters that essentially the letter would be sealed with this wax medallion, if you will, and the wax is just wet, and then the seal that is placed on the wax that has been heated up, um, the seal of a king is then, or a queen is then imprinted, and that seal, when it dries, not only seals the contents from being tampered with, but for the one who is receiving, it is the sure authentication, the clear, clear, this is from this individual, it has not been tampered with, it is authentic. So take that imagery and apply it to this word when it says out of 2 Corinthians, who hath sealed us. He has sealed us with his spirit. That, now remember what I said about change. The, the biggest change that I would say, if I'm gonna use a generic concept, is taking people who have hardened hearts, who are indifferent, who don't care, who are not compassionate, who are impatient, who are mean, belligerent, you keep adding, and they are softened, right? God can then put his stamp, his image, his impression onto that individual's heart. Cannot do that with a hard heart, that stone that can't penetrate that. But once that happens, kind of now we have an interesting analogy. This sealing concept does multiple things. The sealing concept that's done by God does multiple things. For starters, it is the it is the authentication. It's the thing that says authentically, I am his. Now, elsewhere in the Bible, we've got scriptures that say, for example, the Bible says, he says out of Ezekiel, all souls are mine, or you're bought and paid for with his shed blood. But when we get to this concept of sealed, what I love about this is this uh, occurrence here uh, of sealed. Again, he has sealed us with his spirit is Number one, the sign that a hard heart has been softened enough to put the imprint upon it, okay? That's number one. Number two, when people talk about, does, are you saying that this means that since I now am sealed with God's spirit, I can't sin or I can't fall off the tracks? Hell no. And that was for emphasis. It means simply put, this is your starting point and you're not without help. But this concept of sealing also carries with it a, another concept, which if I'm gonna go, and I'll, I'll stick with my notes here because I always do best that way. It speaks of ownership, okay? Who do you belong to? Now, in the natural and in the flesh, when we ask that question, it may be very offensive for somebody hearing that, because in this day and age, 
we don't talk about, for example, slavery. That's a, that's a word that we don't use anymore. But in the Bible, and to this day, I have no problem when I look at Paul. Paul, who is definitely the herald who saved Christianity from just becoming a sect of Judaism, has no problem saying, Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ. And in the truest sense, seeing that Jesus is indeed master and Lord of all. So we don't look at this word in a pejorative way in the Christian world, if it's being used within the confines of this book. But ownership, who I belong to in the spiritual realm, dictates where I go. Now, there are many people in the world who belong nowhere. They have no identity with God or any God of any supreme being of any kind. They have no identity with the devil because that's just as stupid to believe as it is to believe in God. And therefore, they have no identity. I cannot speak for those people and say what their ultimate fate is. Only God knows that. That's not for me to judge. That's not, that's not why I'm here. That's not why I came here. But if we're going to talk about this word, to be sealed, it speaks of something that I can know in my understanding. You know, we, we hear the words, my heavenly Father. We all, we all some, each and every one of us can say we've, we had earthly parents. And in that respect, even if your child is emancipated at the age of 21, there's still a concept of belongingness. Your child came out of you, belongs to you, will always be, even if you are no longer speaking, will always be associated to you and with you by blood, by genetics, by DNA. Here there is a sense of ownership by God. This term sealed says, essentially, God is saying, I own you. Now, we don't become a possession of God to be now relegated into some cattle train where we're just transported and we know not where we go. And this is why I said to you, it really bothers me that people can say they've become Christians without informing themselves. This is an imperative. So this sealing is the beginning of people coming to the desire. That imprint of God on you, which you will not see and people around you will not see, which is impressed upon your inward parts. This is why when Paul said, I bear in my body the marks, the stigmata of the Lord Jesus Christ, Speaking of one that had essentially been like one that had been branded as a slave, he said, I belong to him. The question is, within Christendom as a whole, we have an identity crisis. This is part of why I've said repeatedly, Christendom has become a weak and impotent faith because people no longer really truly identify with the Lord Jesus Christ. They identify with the church. And I'm not, I'm not speaking about the church when Christ said, I'll build my church, they identify with an entity that provides them services, entertainment, but not with God himself. Now, having said that, let's continue. So he says, established. So I want, I want you to put some notes there in your margin about this, and I will do a translation. We'll do a complete Greek translation, just not today. I want everyone to listen and not to get hung up on grammar or Greek or anything else. I don't want anybody saying, I didn't understand because you used all this complicated stuff. I want this to be as simple that even a child can understand what I'm saying. Change will happen. Now, the flip side is I also want to make sure people don't think that I'm insinuating that we will become uh, automatons of one another or of Christ. We're not. We have a mind. We make decisions. It still gives us the ability to sin or to see temptation for what it is. We're not spared from trouble. We're not spared from anything. We are given a path. Jesus says, and this is the way, walk ye in it. You don't want to walk in it? That's your business. But say at least you heard and you can acknowledge this. In the next verse, 22, who has sealed us, the word I've been looking at, and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. And I've taught on this greatly. This word here is, I'll write it out for you, it will be possibly spelt in different ways, but erebon is not a Greek word. It is, this word has been borrowed from 
uh, Semitic languages, specifically in this case, you can go and look it up in Hebrew or Aramaic. It has a few occurrences in the Septuagint, which for those people who don't know what that is, that is a second, third century uh, translation of the Hebrew scriptures into the Greek language for the Greek speakers of that day, which was essentially and most likely the scroll or the scriptures that perhaps Jesus even used in his day, because Greek was the ling lingua franca, the language of the day in Christ's day. So this word, Erebon, actually comes from uh, the Hebrew, and it's really got a very interesting uh, background, if you will. So Ernest represents, first and foremost, let's put a few words down here. We no longer use it in the English. Ernest is a word that is archaic for most. It has, we can say, uh, we might use it in a different way, like I made an earnest attempt. I earnestly tried, but in this way, I do not believe it's used anymore, or if it is, it's seldom used. Uh, but th the nature of this word Arabon or Arabona, we can start first by saying, I'm just going to write over my writing and uh, do it in traditional Scott nature. So, number one, I know it's pretty to write sideways and it looks good at home. It looks like I'm graffitiing my own writing. So, number one, it implies a contract. And why is that? Because it is essentially, and you'll hear me repeat this through each of these um, things I'm going to check off with you, it implies a contract that this Arabone is a deposit of something to guarantee the fullness will be rendered, fulfilled, given, supplied. Okay? So, for example, we do the same thing. Holiday time, people go and they put stuff on layaway, put a little bit of money down. That item is kept until the time where they pay the full price. It's taken and now it belongs to them. So this Erebon represents first and foremost a contract by God when he says all souls are mine. And how does he do that? Well, in this case, for those who come to the faith, he places a deposit of his nature. And by placing a deposit of his nature, I've in the past used the, the concept of a coat check. You get, you get a part of the ticket when you turn your coat in. And when you go to get your coat back, you get you give the ticket in, you get your coat back. It's the same concept. God gives this deposit now, and he says you'll get the full installment when the time comes, which is not in the here and now, but you get that part deposit. The part deposit is his nature in you. Imagine every color of the rainbow in specks of sand being placed in your heart. Some people think that it's this, it may be this magnanimous, it's this large deposit. But actually, it's just a trace. Why? Because our flesh nature is so corrupt that even if we had a larger portion, we would still, I think, be in that place to not fully understand. Why? Because the flesh is corrupt, according to deceitful desires. So when I say contract, it's God's way of saying, this is a promise that I gave to you that I will eventually make good on. Why do I say that? Because go back and read verse 20 of that same chapter. He says, For all the promises, promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen, unto the glory of God by us. That means every promise that the believer claims, when he says amen, it's not just it might happen, it could happen. It says, when we say amen, like people toss around the word amen, which I despise when people do that. It is essentially saying a, an absoluteness of an absoluteness of an absoluteness. It's, it's, it is the highest point of certainty without wavering. And no one, by the way, stays there at all times, but we can come to that place if it's even for a time when we begin to look at God's word. So it is, at the first, a contract. It expresses a contract. It expresses that there may be and will be a delay in the fulfillment. Why? Because it's only a partial pledge. It's only a part. And this is why we have periodic moments 
as believers, and I'm speaking as frank as I can, we have periodic moments of Christ-likeness. Some have more than others. That doesn't make you good, bad, or less, or more. But periodically, we might, be, we might look at somebody and our heart is filled with compassion, but we're not thinking just simply compassion. We're looking at them kind of through the lens like Christ would look at us. We don't see uh, anything else, but that, that person needs help, and I'm equipped to do it. And, and I, I differentiate between the believer and the non-believer at this point. The believer is looking on the individual who needs help with the eyes or the mind of Christ. It's a little bit different than just a good Samaritan who has no attachment to Christ at all. So when I say delay, I say it's important to realize that God has said this is a contract, it's a promise, but the fulfillment will just depend on how long, and that's how long you live. But this contract will be fulfilled eventually in full. That's a promise. All right, third, I reference this. I'm going to keep saying it in different ways. It is a deposit. It's a deposit of God-likeness to you and to me. And I go back now and digress to you will be changed. Now you can understand when I say certain things that are laid out in this book for somebody to not change, and I'm, I'm nobody's fruit inspectors. I don't want anybody to think I'm judging you. I don't judge you. I don't want you judging me. I don't judge you, but I'm saying it's kind of like saying I will go and stand out in the beating sun and my skin will not be changed. Oh, it will be. You may not see it initially. I may have a sunburn or I may not. But underneath it all, my skin, my cells are dying. Things are being changed by the nature of the radiation and rays of the sun. Same thing is happening with the believers. When we talk about a deposit and that you will be changed, this is why it's imperative to go back and look at all the people in the Bible and see that at some point, old and new, people had an experience that radically changed their lives. I can go back and I can talk about Jacob, who was, his name means heel catcher. And at the point where God decided, that's it, it's time, just before he crossed the Ford Jabbok, it says, an angel of the Lord wrestled with him all night and he was crippled there, was never the same, but his name was changed to Israel from that point forward. And although there was, I'm sure that there was probably still a, a Jacob nature in him, what we read for the most part of this now changed Jacob turned Israel is of a different person. Not that the old nature completely went away, but this new person has the focus upon him. Why? His name means governed with God, or we can talk about the name, but the essence of what's there. I can look at any point and find at every turn, Moses who was called, and he said, who am I and who shall I say? And I can't speak, and what am I going to say to the one who stands in front of Pharaoh and says, let my people go? This is what God does. And let's, let's look first at the disciples. And then let's look to ourselves. And let's look, I don't want to look at other people because we can't say, we don't know what's in a person's heart. Only God knows that. We can't say, well, that person hasn't changed at all. I can only speak of the individuals, and I have one exception, who manifestly in their behavior, which unfortunately I have seen, I've been the recipient of, are filled with hate. They spread seeds of discord among the brethren and the cistern. I like that saying. Um, they are really, truly uh, they call themselves Christian by name, but they are indeed the antithesis of anything that is depicted representing Christ. There's no compassion. There is no care. There is no forgiveness. There is no love, unconditional love. So when I look at this, it's important, and I'm also going to put a little comma here and say, not the security that people think of when they talk about like my Baptist friend sometimes talks about it, eternal security. Once saved, always saved. No. I believe you can fall off the wagon and shoot yourself in the foot because we all have that capacity, trust me. 
but security as in, think of it this way, a security deposit that God has made in you. It's his guarantee. Now, what you do with it, remember I just said I can bring you the tools, but what you do with it, and this is why I'm, I need to just beat this to death so somebody says, I get it. What else is here? This bone is also binding. It's on his terms that he chose you. Nothing you did. You could have been the worst, and you fill in the blanks for whatever you think you might have been. Or in your mind, you could have been the most saintly individual that you think ever lived. But let's go with the one who's, you know, the binding agreement is he chose you. Now, I'm going to speak for myself now because it's always easier when I say something so that no one's looking and saying, ah. Oh. Binding contract, binding agreement, binding deposit that says, he said, that's mine. Now, many times I've, I've looked at that and I've said, why would he want me? You know, I wasn't brought up the way some of you were in a real Christian home. And I didn't have like the Christian roots that many, many of you have, many of my listeners have. Not that I was pagan. But why me? And that's the beauty of God's sovereignty and of his choosing. He can choose whomever he wants. And when he does so, he doesn't do it on the merits of your, your personal achievements in life. He doesn't do it on, on the course of your gender or your color or your race or your upbringing. He says, I want that one. For whatever the reason, I've said this repeatedly, I, I, will, I will ask. Probably it'll be the first question that I'll ask after saying thank you. It will be why. Why me and why not? that person over there. And I don't know if that person over there, I'm just using that as an example. But then I start to think, God's love towards me. You remember what Paul wrote when he said, the Holy Spirit shed abroad in our hearts, poured out. Well, this is God's nature. God is not a man to lie. God does not change his mind whimsically, like, no, you know, I chose you, but you're too much of a nut. I wanted to say something else. You're to whatever. It's binding. Now, here's where I do actually have the keys to my future. I can decide to take God at his word and look at this nature of this contract, see that it will, it will come to fruition, it will be delivered in full, that God did something in me for whatever the reason. I know not why, but I'm not going to complain. But... It tells me something. He's given me this piece of equipment to give me the confidence that he will not abandon me midway through. That if I'm now committed to him, he's committed to me. He committed to me before I was ever committed to him. And although this all sounds like a bunch of rhetoric, it's not. This is the very thing that Jesus spoke of in his high priestly prayer in John 17. When he, when he says, essentially, he needs to go away. He wants to be back, restore me to the glory, Father, I once had. But essentially, be with them and be, help them to be as we are. I with you, you and me, I with them, them and me, essentially as one, functioning as a unit. So when I say binding, it's important to recognize this word, Erebon, has a long history. And, and these, these words, sealed, uh, the, word, the Greek word for sealed, this Greek word for uh, what I'm using as deposit or erebon, uh, earnest. And there's one other word. Actually, in Greek uh, literature, was a commercial term used for explicitly for binding contracts that were non they were non negotiable, not to be broken, uh, but all used in trade and business and commerce. So it's got a long established history. Interestingly enough. This word for erebon, if you were reading the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament, Hebrew Old Testament, there is that wonderful chapter that we periodically visit out of Genesis, which, if you remember, is the story of Tamar. You remember that story? 
Well, that wasn't very enthusiastic. Okay, well, because I know I've got people here who, who aren't familiar, and I gotta do this because of the nature of this, let's go there. So I make sure that everybody understands that this is not some new thing, but something that really will speak in a very bold and graphic way. Let's see here, where do we go? Chapter 38 of Genesis, and I'm, I, I can't give you the background, but I wanna just do this quickly because I'm gonna run out of time. Came to pass that at that time Judah went down from his brethren, turned into a certain Adullamite whose name was Hira, and Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. He took, he took her and went in unto her. And she conceived, bare a son, called his name Ur, and again uh, another son, Onan, and yet again another son named Shelah. Uh, now, Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. And, of course, as the story goes, all the sons die, but he eventually promises one to his daughter, but essentially they're all gone. She says, but now I'm not going to have any children. What am I going to do? I'm, I have to speed this up, so I'm sorry. But you can at least go back and read this in your own time. Judah, who goes along the way, and uh, he basically is dishonest with Tamar and essentially not providing uh, a husband for her to bear children with. And in, in those days, if a woman did not bear children, she had no value, no worth whatsoever. So, uh, of course, uh, it's so clear that she is so desperate to have a child, to have purpose. Uh, it says that she, when she was obviously grieving the death, uh, she put, says she put her widow's garments off from her covered her with a veil, wrapped herself, sat in an open place, which is, by the way, in Timnath, for she saw that Sheila was grown. I'm sorry, they didn't all die. Sheila was grown, was not given unto him to wife. So she sees this. She basically dresses herself up. Judah sees her and thinks that she is a prostitute because she covered her face. He turned to her, by the way, and said, Go to, I pray thee, let me come into thee. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law, and said, What will thou give me, that thou mayest come into me? He said, I'll send thee a kid from the flock. And she said, Will thou give me a pledge? There is the word. If you look in your Septuagint, you'll find that's our word being used in the Greek text. A pledge till thou send it. And he said, What pledge shall I give thee? And she said, Thy signet, which would be the ring, which would be the thing that would be in that day what would be stamped as a seal. Thy signet thy bracelets, thy staff that is in thy hand. And he gave it to her, came in unto her, and she conceived by him. And if you know the story, after a while, he goes away, and he says, now he's going to send the, the kid that he promised, only when he goes and he sends someone to look for the woman and says, where's the whore that was here? There wasn't any harlot here. We don't know of anything like this. Now, he sees his daughter-in-law, and she's pregnant. He's about to basically condemn her and stone her. And then, basically, she lets him know, uh, here, here, these are your items. Never leave home without them. It's like the American Express card. Here's your earnest deposit right here. You like it back? Because he was going to accuse her of being a whore. And that price, the penalty, would be being put to death, stoned to death. So you have a clear concept of this word being used even in antiquity, which is contractual. It expresses, of course, a delay. It is a deposit of nature, and it is binding even beyond our laws. So it's really important to understand this is not some word that we're going to toss around and use in a kind of just, ah, you know, it's there. It is in full force. And I'm back to Corinthians, and we were looking at 122. It says, the earnest, that arabone of the Spirit in our hearts. Interesting that Paul then will repeat this one more time. Now, I ask you a question. If you read the context of where this comes in, it's pretty clear that he essentially is saying, because they're questioning, essentially, his ministry, 
his sincerity in what he's saying, he's trying to show these individuals, essentially, I'm the messenger, but here is the actuality of what God has done. Now, whether or not they understood what he was conveying and whether or not they took it in that sense, but he repeats it once more in a different way, and this time with another dimension to it. So if you turn to the fifth chapter, and remember this is a letter. There's, there was no chapter and verse. The verse divisions were first, uh, the chapter divisions were first added, and then the verse divisions at a later time, which is relatively new in the history of the Bible, but then was just a letter, just continuous writing with uh, the few and seldom stops in the Greek, because Greek has this Greek has limited punctuation. You might get a dot to signify at the top the end of a sentence, or what we call nomen sacras, which are little squigglies on top of lines to abbreviate words like Holy Spirit, uh, Numa Hagion, or Jesus Christ, or words that are, are shortened uh, as holy words. But in any event, so it's just a letter being written. He says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. And I need to make a good translation of this because it's kind of convoluted and very sloppy how they translated this. So uh, look for that in the coming weeks. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan being burdened not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given us the earnest of the Spirit. Now keep reading. Therefore we are always confident, knowing this, while, whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. And then he says, then being absent from the body to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether we are present or absent, we may be accepted of him. And then he goes on to say, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to what he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, I'm pointing this out to say something specific now. The earnest of the Spirit, when he says God has done this same thing in us, giving us this deposit. What he's saying is, I hate to do this to you, but in the previous chapter, he was talking about buffetings and the things that we will encounter through life. And then goes into this, for we know that if our earthly, essentially, it's not, it does not read like this, but I'm going to say it like this. Take courage, be strong, no matter what's going on, whatever buffetings you're going to take, know this. This will be dissolved, and the actuality of what was promised will be fulfilled. But in the meantime, God has given, given that deposit of his nature to tether you, to make you see, to make you understand an eternal destiny that links you to him in a special way, that it is God that has done this thing, that it is God that will clothe you with a new body, and it is God in his binding contract with you will make good on the thing that he has started. The Bible says he started something in you and he is faithful to bring it to fruition. So it's important for us to understand this concept of being sealed and having this deposit help us to understand more about an eternal perspective. See, without this deposit in us, all we would have is information received, and this is the way most people who don't understand this concept Look at Christianity. This is information I will process in my brain, and I will decide whether I like or don't like, whether I accept or reject, whether it's good or bad. But for someone who has, with the eyes of faith, come to look to the risen Savior, there's a different element at work, and that is what has been placed in your heart. And when I'm pointing to my heart, I know the heart beats, and it is an organ, and it does not have thought capacity, but I'm speaking in ways that we can all wrap our minds around. The thing that's happening is within the mind, and the mind is governing the rest of our person, that essentially sees the difference between information that would be simply taken in without this element of God in me, or the thing that basically makes me part 
of the family of God, that is my guarantee, my contract that says I am his. And there's only one criteria for the continuance of this. That is my faith in him, looking unto him who is the author, the architect of faith. He's the one that has set the course for me. So examining this and understanding then, I go back to reread the passages where it talks about Jesus being raised up from the dead, that he's the first goer, he's the first fruit. He is the prototype or the, the archetype of what we shall be, not in the now, but a microcosm. Specks of sand, if you want to call it that, deposited in us. They're small, but enough to give wisdom and guidance, enough to guide in a way where people think, are you persuading people in the faith? No, I can't even do that. I could talk persuasively. And in the flesh, I sh I'm sure I could persuade people. I could sell you on Christianity, but that's not going to be saving faith. The saving faith that occurs is the trusting act in Christ. And for that simple act, Christ is formed in your heart by faith. He places that deposit in me. Now I'm no longer just taking in information that's remaining information that I'm reading, but I'm now processing this information through the eyes or the spectacles of Christ, understanding what links me to him and the family of God is not my will or desire or feelings, but something he has promised, he has done to me and for me. So when I say change should happen, it means it may not happen today, but as a believer, our mindset towards death and dying is changed. Our mindset towards life and living is also changed. And our mindset towards the things eternal should become a little bit more focused. Say a person lives here. We have Guinness World Book. There, 120, 116, 110, oldest living person. That's it, folks. That's the best you're going to get if you go that far. And I guarantee you, most of us won't make it across the 100, 100 yard line. Okay, very few people make it to 100. So look at the time you're alive. And most of us have, as I've said, less time behind us. I mean, we have, we have more time spent behind us and less time in front of us in the now. So my question is, why not look at this information? Why not take it seriously? Don't take it as, oh, this is just a, it's a spiritual thing that we do on Sunday. And then, then we close the book and we go about our business during the week, never once giving a second thought to this. No, if this is really true and God has placed something in me that is of him, then my nature day by day is being changed. And it may not be something that is instantaneous overnight. Somebody sees me and says, whoa. But it will be something that when I stand before him, he will recognize. And this is what I, I, I need to say this before I get to next week. He will realize that when I stand before the judgment seat, I'm not being judged for my sin, I'm not being judged about salvation, but he will also understand and take into account the imperfectness of my understanding as, and as I went, how my understanding grew and got closer to the mind and heart of God to where the things as I progress in my walk become the things that as they are put up as an open book and discussed, uh, divulged, made plain for all to see, he will take into consideration that this change was happening at a very slow rate. He will take into consideration that I am frail and imperfect. And he will take into consideration that I am still sinning and in sinning flesh. He'll take all that into consideration, which should take a little bit of what people tend to get fearful of. Well, have I done enough or should, should I do more? Because it's not in the doing. That becomes works, that becomes will worship, that becomes works that are not of God. But the things that God impressed upon my heart during the course of this life, these are the things that God's going to look at and he's going to take up and make plain. These are the things for which the rewards will be dispensed. Not all will have the same. Not all will be judged the same. And as again, as I said, this is not a judgment that sends you to heaven or hell. This is a judgment for believers and believers only. Everyone else will be at the white throne. That's where 
everyone will be judged who is not in Christ. But those who are in Christ at the judgment seat, we'll talk about that hopefully God willing next week. But what I want to say to you to kind of take the sting, because some people get so worried when they start reading this and then it becomes, well, I can't deal with this. It's too frightening. It makes me too afraid. God's not the author of fear. And if by faith we lean into this subject, God will make clear that he knows our frame. He knows that we are imperfect. He knows our mindset, that we are constantly, I'm going to call it vacillating, in and out of why we wear two garments, one that we're permanently right now clothed in, which is Adam, Adam's clothing, and the, the trace that we can barely see, which is why I repeat again when he says we look through a glass darkly, we get just a little glimmer of what we shall be, which should give us the encouragement to keep pressing on, to keep learning, and to stay focused. Now, I can't tell somebody, somebody might say, well, how, you keep talking about change. Yes, because the change will be something that you did not do. I can tell you, I know, I can look back at 25 years of trusting and faithing, and I can tell you unequivocally, I know the areas where God really went to work. Is he finished with them? Absolutely not. But he went to work there. They were the areas that blatantly for me in my mind, I was completely aware of. And it, th these were the areas that repeatedly I found myself in the scriptures trying to learn more about, even though I didn't realize this, this is actually something that's happening to me, for me, which has nothing to do with my preaching to you or whatever you may do in your own time, but this was for me. God will do the same thing for each person. For some people, it's ego. Their egos are so big, they have no humility. Believe me, God has a way of giving you or me the three, what I call the three-legged treatment, till you figure out you're not as big as you think you are and you're not as good as you think you are. Neither am I. God has a way of cutting down the idea that somehow, oh, there'll be those people that say, you just got to go out there and keep doing good works. But we know one thing. It's not bad to do good for people, but that's not going to save you. And in fact, most people try to replace the sacrifice of Christ with something they can do. God says, that's unacceptable. These are all the things that God will make plain once we quit trying to think. The information is given to us to simply process and we have no responsibility there afterwards. Change will happen, just like a bodybuilder going into the gym. Maybe somebody started su superbly overweight, but you keep going, eventually there will be a metamorphosis, there will be a transformation, there will be some change that not only will be at first slightly visible to you, but over the course of time, years, will become visible primarily to him because he knows what he's doing. Eventually it will become, it may be visible to others, but the most important thing is that change will happen. And it's the change that he does based on what he has done by placing this ceiling and this deposit in us. I pick up next week on this series. Hopefully I'm helping somebody out there who needs to have some reassurance in these crazy times we're living in where people are spouting off everything, but nothing that gives substance and nothing that is truly meaningful. Hopefully this is the information for at least one person out there to say, I feel a little bit better. I'm going to spend time looking at this subject a little bit more because obviously it's important to God. He repeated it several times through the Apostle Paul, but he's not the only one talking about this. Maybe we'll see where else these themes occur in the Bible. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call one 800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.